much. Uh, welcome to Kigari uh, Council for Nurses. We're very glad to connect. Um, you know, I've been a very big admirer of the work you're doing uh, from German by impacting around the world. So let me just a little bit start with, uh, with a little bit simple question because I mean, it's simple, but it's interesting, depending with the pandemic going on now. Um, What's your thought on how the EU handled COVID uh, and, of course, the competition by vaccination between EU countries and all those elements? Okay. First of all, thank you so much for having me. Uh, we, we have a soft spot for Rwanda here at the Munich Security Conference. We've been fortunate enough to have your president with us quite a, a number of times. Uh, we are very fortunate to count Mrs. Mushikivabo uh, as member of our board. Uh, she was a member of our board when she was foreign minister in, in Rwanda and now as the head of the Francophonie, she remains member of our board. So it's good to be here um, and I'm glad you're starting with such an easy question. <laughs> I'm, I'm one of the biggest fans of the European Union that you can probably find and I, I believe Corona has shown both the best and the worst of the European Union at the very same time. It could have been an enormous chance to make the, the benefits of regional cooperation even more visible to uh, the population. And I think for better or worse, that uh, chance was missed. Mm. Uh, you know, whether, you know, the, the whole, where exactly the fault lies is still open to debate. However, I think it has been a missed chance. It is, um, I think, an enormous shame that particularly countries like uh, Great Britain can now say that by nationalizing control, by taking back control from the European level, they have created an advantage uh, for themselves and for their populations and uh, in, in that way damaging the European Union even, even further. I, I hope and I see many uh, positive signs that the European Union will make up for it down the road, that uh, we will hopefully have learned a valuable lesson and that the European Union will uh, deal with, you know, catastrophes like this in a, in a very different style in the years to come. That, that's a hope. Um, there, there is not yet enough evidence uh, to substantiate it, but I, I do believe we will see a European Union that will look a lot harder at pandemic preparedness. They will look, look a lot harder at communicating its own benefits to its population. Uh, and that will look a lot harder at coordinating its member states and creating real value added for the member states. Because mm -hmm. in the second that the member states have the feeling that they are slowed down by interacting through the European Union, uh, they, uh, they will retreat and retract uh, in the years to come. And I don't think that's in anyone's interest. So, yeah, I think it's a mixed picture. It's, so, it's interesting. You just touched on, on, on the UK. Let, let me, let me get back to, come back to this. So, I mean, the United Kingdom left the EU. Everybody knows the Brexit. It was everywhere. Um, and I had a question. Somebody asked me this question. I want to ask this the same question. Is this the, the beginning of the downfall of the European Union? And what does that mean also for other regional organizations like, you know, African Union and the other ones? Mm. Um, you know, I, I love the easy questions that you that you put up front. Uh, listen, I I think it's it's a shame that that we've lost uh, the United Kingdom, uh, and I do believe at the same time that it put some pressure on the European Union to do what I've just said before, namely to create perceivable benefits for the population. I, I would argue that one of the reasons why so many Brits were ready to leave the European Union is because they didn't know what they had. They didn't know about the benefits. You know, I, you hear that all the time. That, oh, had we known that roaming will become more expensive again? Or had we known that we can't buy houses that easily again in, in, uh, in southern Spain or southern France? We would not have voted for leaving the European Union. So that brings me back to my previous point. The European Union must become much better at communicating its value added. And I think everyone would, would sign up to that. And I think that is true for every other regional organization and for every global governance mechanism. I, I would argue that WHO hasn't been as good as could have been in, in the, the last couple of months, particularly in communicating its, its benefits. 
The same is true for the UN system, for the WTO, and I, I do believe there is a legitimate argument for reform and for trying to make our regional and global organizations fit for purpose again. And, you know, I did my PhD on the African Union and the, the regional... Yes. Uh, That's why I asked you that question. <laughs> and I think, you know, in, in one way, you've got it much easier than the European Union because you've got this, this common narrative that I think is brilliant to create an organization. And um, you also have it much easier to create graspable and perceivable benefits because you're, at, you know, you're starting at a lower base level. Mm -hmm. However... Um, I, I think, you know, given how, how fast your populations are growing, how enormous challenges are, um, the, the clear-cut case or the case for a regional organization is much clearer than it is in, in, in Central Europe. And, and my hope is that, that you guys look at both the successes of regional cooperation in Europe and also the failures and learn your own lessons from it. And I, I remain a huge fan of the, the African Union and I do believe that it has become uh, an organization to, to look up to in many instances. So uh, let's see where it goes in the next couple of years, but with the support of countries like Rwanda and others, um, I think the African Union really is a force to reckon with. What is the, what is the, what's the cause of this um, rising of extremist parties political parties in Europe, in Europe, in different countries. What, what is the cause of these extremist parties, the rising of them? You know, um, again, and I, I really don't want to make this point too often, but they have an easy game in many ways because they, they have a target, namely the current national governments and the regional bodies uh, that, that have a hard time in making a good case to their populations and it's so easy to attack the European Union for being inefficient because it is quite often. It is so easy to attack national governments for being inefficient because they are uh, in, in many cases. And I, I think the, the accelerating media uh, cycle makes it very easy for extremists and populists to grow very quickly but we've seen it in many instances over the last couple of years. Uh, they will fall down as quickly as they've risen if you if you take away their their key arguments and, and topics. Look at Gerd Wilders in in the Netherlands. You know he yeah. was up to forty percent in in the in the last election. Yeah, and he is sort of beneath I think eight percent currently. You know, populists are dangerous. And, and we must counter them. And I think the best way to counter them is by providing value added to the populations that are susceptible to the arguments of extremists. Uh, but we will never make everyone happy. There will always be extremist fringes. And uh, I think it's really about strengthening the soft underbelly of democracy by strengthening the middle rather than trying to make the fringes happy, which will never work. So, so this comes to that question um, that I've seen is, is you, you touch a little bit, but I would love to hear a little from your point of view. What's, what's the weakness of the European Union? I mean, you mentioned a little bit not be able to communicate properly, but what are the two elements you see as a weakness for the organization? You know, I mean, people have written hundreds and hundreds of books about the weaknesses of the European Union. There are not quite as many books about the strengths of the European Union, but there should be. I believe some of its weaknesses are actually strength. You know, the, the necessity to find a common denominator, the, the very complicated, cumbersome process of creating agreements uh, amongst, you know, many, many member states with totally uh, different political agendas, um, I, I think is important. In, in many ways, the road is the objective, uh, if I can put it, by creating, you know, or institutionalizing bodies and dialogues. Uh, the European Union has made an enormous contribution already, and it has made an enormous contribution in the last couple of years. I think that the way the European Union acted towards Great Britain, that we sort of, you know, stuck together for yeah. three years in a very difficult negotiation cycle, shows that uh, Europe can and does work sometimes. I think there are a couple of issues that I would consider real weaknesses 
it's our inability to project power. It's our inability to safeguard our borders. It's our inability to promote our values abroad. You know, look towards Syria, look towards Libya, look towards Yemen. The, the European Union response, for better or worse, was botched, was weak, was uh, unsustainable in many ways. Mm -hmm. If we want to play a role on the world stage, that's something the European Union will have to work on and the Munich Security Conference. And I'm personally convinced uh, that's the right uh, position always argues we need qualified majority voting on foreign and security policy decisions. We need a consolidation in the decision making processes. Um, our own foreign minister in Germany has recently said, you know, why do we call Mr. Borrell not foreign minister of the European Union. It's little things like that that would help major structural changes like qualified majority voting so that Cyprus or another state, uh, you know, cannot hijack a decision yes. uh, it, as, as it has done uh, on, on Syria, for example. I'm, I'm very much interested in, in, in the... In the we just mentioned it, the process of within the decision making within the organization the European Union. But um, we could go deep and deep in, into you. But let me maybe make one last question about the European Union. Where do you see um, areas of opportunities and, or partnership between the European Union and, and Africa, Africa in general? I mean, especially under the new president, it's very interesting the dynamic. I, I think there are endless opportunities and imperatives for cooperation. Um, I very much hope that the European Green Deal can be Africanized. Um, this Green Deal will only work if Africa is uh, integrated in, in the planning and also in, in the financial flows. I believe the same must be true for sustainable development um, activities. I remain convinced that the European Union could, uh, could gain a lot in Africa could gain a lot if we were able to synchronize our development initiatives and our development efforts. I mean, let mm -hmm. me give you one example. Why do we have to have 17 national development banks in the European Union if we could, you know, pool the money and the resources in one powerful European development bank? There are yeah. so many, there may be arguments against it, but just as a sort of an exemplary question, there, are, there is so much, you know, opportunity uh, out there that, that we could use as European Union and as Germany, by the way, as well, um, on sustainable development, on stabilization efforts, on um, standardization efforts, you know, I, when it comes to uh, financial mechanisms, when it comes to uh, political processes, I think there's still some room of um, synchronization between our continents. And I do believe that that must be approached on a European level rather than a bilateral national. I see. I see. Uh, so let's, let's get a little bit out of, out of EU and just a little bit focus on, on globalization. What is your view on how important, uh, you know, militarism and conferences like Munich Secret Con uh, Conference now, especially after Trump and, you know, the pandemic, the COVID pandemic? Yeah. You know, obviously, I'm slightly biased. I, I believe that there is a very, very good argument for places like the Munich Security Conference to um, complement uh, global governance mechanisms and to challenge other multilateral fora. I mean, we're totally independent, totally neutral, committed to providing the world's best platform for the debate of foreign security policy. We want to be useful. We don't want to do what others are doing or, you know, copy or duplicate. We want to see where our global reach and visibility can help to draw attention to important topics. And we want to bring people together that may not get together in the same intimacy uh, in other fora. You know, there is the UN General Assembly. There is the annual meetings of the World Bank and the IMF. Yes. These are very scripted events. Um, there is very little room for for building personal relationships, for building networks, for actually sitting down for several hours and discussing a topic at depth. And I think that is a huge advantage of the Munich Security Conference. Um, and uh, that, that's one that, that we are pushing and promoting. But, 
you know, when, when you ask me about multilateralism per se, uh, obviously, you know, I, I could talk for hours and hours of how the, the Munich Security Conference can help uh, draw attention to the unquestionable benefits of a revived multilateral order. You know, we've, and maybe you haven't seen it, but we, we, we published a, a report last year called Westlessness. Yes, I saw it. You know, that, that was the idea that the world somehow was becoming less Western and that the West itself was becoming less Western. You know, in, in a way for the global South, that may seem a totally outdated and slightly weird concept. We never meant it in a regional way. We meant it as a, you know, uh, in a conceptual value-based way. For us, the West was this idea of, you know, liberal democracies working together for the global good. And, and I believe that there is a huge argument for that. If you look at the rise of authoritarianism around the world, if you look at the Chinas and Russias of this world, and by the way, if you look at the, the incredibly positive developments in, in many areas of Africa, we may need another concept but the West, but this basic idea that the good ones need to stand up and push back against the rise of the bad ones, I think is, is true. And for that, we need an idea like multilateralism. And maybe multilateralism is a little too technical a term, but, but we do need an idea of the good versus evil. And I think uh, the alliance for multilateralism that Germany has helped to bring about is a good start. Yeah. Uh, but, but maybe an alliance of democracies or, a, you know, G20 plus plus. There are many ideas out there that are deserving of a little more attention. See. Uh, so I just want to leave a comment about, um, uh, you know, President Joe Biden being elected in the United States. So there's a very interesting new dynamic in, in the, in the trans transatlantic partnership today between uh, EU and Europe and America. So what, what, what's your thought? Uh, how do you see the transatlantic partnership today with President Biden in the White House? I mean, obviously, you know, as Munich Security Conference, we are always working with both uh, sides of the aisle. Yeah. Um, but we are thrilled that our old friend Joe Biden uh, yeah, he's has been a speaker many times. Yeah. Yes, he he's been twenty three times to yes. the MSC since nineteen eighty. Uh, he's been as a senator, as a private citizen, as a vice president, uh, and he joined us, uh, albeit only digitally, in, in February as U.S. president. Um, I, I think the first one hundred days, uh, which have just passed, I think, uh, have been very promising. He promised America will be back. I think America is back in many instances. The question is, where's the rest? You know, I, I do feel an increasing level of frustration uh, in the White House and in, in other bits and pieces of the US government that they have really made good on their promises. They have, mm -hmm. you know, returned to the WHO. They have uh, rejoined the Paris Agreement. They have um, done virtually everything they promised. But they're not getting a lot of love from Europe, uh, particularly from, from Germany and, and the, uh, our French uh, colleagues. Uh, look at uh, Nord Stream 2, look at the 2% NATO commitment, uh, look at the discussion we're having about the regulation of artificial intelligence, mm -hmm. uh, look at our unclear, in their view, uh, positions on, on Russia and China. Um, look on, you know, European digital sovereignty, or as uh, Macron said, European autonomy when it comes to foreign security policy. Yeah. Those are all building sites in the transatlantic relationship that we need to tackle and work on. And I think the Munich Security Conference, we started the so-called Road to Munich campaign, which will now run till next year, February, uh, where we want to look at every single building site in the relationship. And there are many. And some of them, by the way, are in Africa. Uh, the recognition of Western Sahara, um, the situation at the Horn of Africa, the current uh, uh, trouble in, in Northern Ethiopia, uh, the use of Djibouti as a hub. I mean, you know, the list is endless uh, and I could go on forever and ever, but there are so many building sites that we need to get our act together on that um, I am I'm slightly skeptical if we Europeans are currently making the most out of the chances that the the outstretched hand of the Biden administration is offering. 
I see. Um, so let me ask the last two questions and then we'll jump with the audience. Quickly, you had a, a fantastic conference um, in February, digital experience, let me say it that way. Uh, so the, the Munich Security Co uh, Conference for 2021, if I'm not wrong, was postponed to some time this year. Well, do you have the new dates and what's on the agenda? Okay, yeah. I get asked this question about 100 times a day, and the answer is always the same. Um, we will share the date and the location as soon as it's confirmed. Uh, we will do something this year, but it will probably look very different from a normal Munich Security Conference. Mm -hmm. The theme is quite clear. We believe, um, and I'm not sure if you know the physical concept of state of matter. You know, uh, something can be fluid, something can be in, in the form of gas. We believe that the international political situation is sort of stuck between these states of matter. And as if you know your physics, a state of matter only changes if you change the volume, the pressure or the temperature. Yes. And we believe this, the system is currently stuck between competition and cooperation. Um, we're not quite sure, you know, let's take an example, Germany and Russia or Germany and China. We are not 100% sure whether our system is geared towards competition or towards cooperation. And there are those that always say, you know, you can do both at the same time. Joe Biden said, let cooperation never crowd out competition and vice versa, which is a very sensible thing to say. But it looks really good on paper. But if you try to think about it, in actually, actually, yeah. it's way super difficult. So I think that will be the topic. Beyond Westlessness, can we get out of this unclear state of matter and sort of, you know, decide on which fork in the road we're going to take. Is it cooperation globally or is it competition globally? Uh, we need to decide at some point. I have a lot of questions, a follow-up question on that, but we don't have time. But my last question to you, I mean, you have a PhD on African Union, you, are, you work for Kofi Annan, so you're kind of familiar with, with, with Africa and a little bit what's happening around those. I, I just, my last question is looking at what Rwanda has achieved in the 27 years after the genocide against the Tutsi in 1994. Um, what lesson do you think the world can learn from Rwanda? One or two lessons you think the world can learn from Rwanda? There are lots of lessons. I mean, you've, uh, you've really shown the world how reconciliation and transitional justice can work uh, out of an enormously tragic situation. I think you've made the, the most. You can uh, teach the world many valuable lessons when it comes to economic development, the digitalization of the bureaucracy. I mean, you are leading in the, the UN's ease of doing business index. I think it takes two days to create a limited company in Rwanda. 